Muy buenos días a todos. Good morning, everyone. How are you all? Welcome to the second webinar of this innovation series for energies. We are organizing between Australian Embassy and UDESC and Colombia Inteligente this time. We want to welcome everyone. Thank you for your time today, this morning. We're gonna just give a few minutes until all the people are gonna get connected. And we are gonna begin, I think in uh, two or three minutes, we're gonna begin. So thank you very much for your punctuality. Para, pues, para respetar el tiempo de todos. To respect entonces, everyone's time, we're gonna start to the second session of the innovation series of energy today. Uh, approach in the micro grids topic, having in mind that every time more countries are incorporated these non-conventional and renewable energetics inside their energetic system, site system, each time it's gaining more important, more importance in the energetic market. So Australia currently is offering these mean to offering challenges the increase in electricity costs, maintenance of infrastructure, and the need to offer service to a bigger coverage, geographically talking. So having in mind that most of the population is based uh, close to the shoreline, so that the microgrids are systems that are just to connect all these remote people uh, around the country. So of course, if they are integrated between having a rise in different countries worldwide. So for us, it's so important for us to start today, like talking you a little bit, this sample about Australia is making through our speakers. And we want to welcome to our partners in this event, the Australian ambassador, Erika Strasser, Camilo, I'm sorry, Andesco, and Juan David from Colombia Inteligente. So, Joe, me, I'm Alejandro Calderon, head of business development from Austria, which is the agency of commerce and from the Australia's government based in Bogota. So, Camilo Sanchez. I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning, everyone. Alejandra, thank you for the presentation. I want to greet our ambassador, Erika, has performed an important labor, not only for her country, but for Colombia. And of course, this is our second event. The last time we were talking about hydrogen and we were talking about the where are the incentives for this country and what the important are to have this ally country to help these processes. So this other topic, which is so important for us in this moment, as you said, a lot of uh, municipality in the periphery of Colombia are needing from these processes. And we are looking for here for these very interesting speakers that are gonna help us to close those gaps and that we have had and we're having this moment. And after all the association of the utilities in Colombia, and it's been working the last years a very strong way, the SODs, and one of the SODs more important six is to have 100% of energy in all the Colombian territory. And of course, the networks are so important for this process in the last census we have since 2018. We have a coverage of almost 97%, but that last mile, the last pour is the hardest. And of course, that it's fundamental to have the conscious to bring the specialists for these processes. And that's why we've been working hand by hand with the government and the countries that have the cut edge technology. And we're very happy, we have very sure we're gonna shift pretty good investments required in this process, more than 3.5 billion of these Colombian pieces that we are gonna invest in 257 solution and affecting 170,000 Colombians. And that's why it's very important to bring here for all the organization 
and for our million Colombian, it's performing its task to, of course, to keep closing those gaps. We are still working for clean energies and more and the more cleanest metrics from around the world. And we're very committed to fulfill those uh, challenges we have established, not only in the UDS and but uh, around international level. That's why today I'm very proud to be here with microgrids Ocra Solar and Cinco Day that even not being here, we are presenting that company that of course it's so important for the development. So just is to welcome you to, you know, to Desco, it's the association of utilities and with you, we're gonna help with the re economical reactivation to boost the economic in the Colombian territory. So a hack for uh, every one of you. I thank you very much for the invitation. So thank you very much Camilo for your introduction. So I think that opening the floor, I'm gonna present to Ramon from General Microgrids is the president CEO of General Microgrids for APAC Africa. And the main interest approach is the modernization of the electric networks and the application of new resources to manage a sustainable energy and very reliable and the micro rates is that he's federal assessor for commerce department in ISD and of course in the emerging technology for the energy commission of California. So he has welcomed the working group for micro rates in the micro groups alliance. This foundation of Medi nation has funded and preceded the international micro rate association and the Australian micro grid center of excellence. So Terry, the war is for you. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Yeah. I'm looking very much forward to this discussion. Uh, I have the um, honor of having these types of discussions frequently with different governments. Uh, and this is the first time that I've actually worked with the Colombian government uh, on this particular topic. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, First, I wanted to state that uh, I actually have a footprint in both the United States and in Australia. Uh, I live in Australia now in Perth, and I will be actually talking on behalf of the work that we've done here in Australia. This presentation today is going to be uh, quite a wild ride on the evolution of the electric grid. We're gonna land on microgrids, but I wanted to do a real quick study of how the microgrid evolution um, progressed. And if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about where the center of excellence, our, the Australian center of excellence uh, is focused and how we're trying to drive the industry forward. So this is the talk that I'm going to give today. I'm going to begin with uh, the evolution of the big grid. Um, talk a little bit about decentralization and the different ways in which we can decentralize electrification. Then I'll talk a little bit about the composition of microgrids and the role that it plays, particularly in the areas that we've talked about. Also, I wanna uh, spend a little time talking about some of the innovations that have emerged and that really make uh, microgrids reliable, sustainable, economic, and um, you know, a, a very valid investment for uh, both private investors and um, the public sector. Then I'll show you some examples of projects that uh, we've been involved in across the world. We've, wa we've worked in four different continents and I'll just show you some examples of types of projects just to give you a feel of the range of complexity. And then preceding this event, somebody sent me a number of questions they would like to have answered, which I have answered, and I'll go through those rather quickly. Uh, so uh, first I wanted to talk about the evolution of the grid. The evolution of the grid uh, was originally an electromechanical system that over time in the, in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s, we started to overlay uh, ICT, information communications technology. And that really was an enabler for us to provide more reliability and uh, higher fidelity of control of all the assets. What we didn't realize was that the number of assets was going to change dramatically on the grid. 
because many of the production assets now were in customers' homes. So it was very advantageous for the evolution of the uh, smart grid, which became kind of foundational for us to look at how do we advance the state of the art in microgrids. And I'll be talking about that a little bit. So in terms of my background, I uh, worked on very large grids in the United States for about 10 years. And then I transitioned for the last 15 years or so focused strictly on microgrids. So my background is a reflection of the big grid. And I'll be talking about how we can have grid connected microgrids and disconnected microgrids. But it's with that kind of background that hopefully sheds a little light on where I think that the industry is going. So for a few moments, I'll talk about kind of the different types of microgrids that we see occurring. We see microgrids that are part of the large community. Uh, and we see these popping up quite honestly in North America and some of them in Australia. But what we see is that many of these microgrids uh, are within an existing network. And the best place to monitor and manage them is at the utilities substation level, uh, because that's the demarcation point between transmission and distribution. I'm actually gonna be talking about that particular subject a little bit later. Then we see many, many microgrids that are not connected to the grid at all. They may one day become connected to the grid, but we anticipate them being self-sufficient. And so we talk about microgrids that operate a single town or in, in Australia, particularly here in Western Australia, we have many mining camps and mining operations uh, that are microgrids. Also, we see seaports and airports being great candidates for remote microgrids. One of the things that we see happening on islands is that um, the best reliability for a microgrid is a series of microgrids spread across the island that are interconnected by a low voltage transmission line. And we call those uh, ring topology because if there's ever an outage at, the, at any one point in the transmission line, it doesn't take down any of the other systems. We'll talk a little bit about that later. And then lastly, one of the most important things to think about for microgrids is that it's uh, a collection of different resources. And those resources, some of them are owned by private entities and some of them by the institutional investor, uh, utility investors. Uh, I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail on how that works and where we see those uh, being most efficient. And then the last topic here is village microgrids. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work in India for five years and also in East Africa for a number of years. And many of the microgrids that we started up were very small projects, very small uh, village projects. But um, in one case, many of those village microgrids were connected then to the larger grid at a future point in time. The last subject around microgrids that I wanna to just touch on is this topic of standalone power systems. These are uh, systems that are in vogue here in Australia. Essentially, uh, they're different than a microgrid because the supply of power always matches the demand. And uh, when we look at microgrids, uh, particularly as we move from you know, the smart grid industry into microgrid industry, we're talking about advanced microgrids that are using a high degree of IT. Uh, and so we have a much better fidelity of control over the devices. So standalone systems are kind of in a compartment of their own. And, and I won't be re actually referring to those because that's um, not really where the, the direction of the industry is heading. So just so we all have the same level of context for what a microgrid is, we have a collection of uses of energy and we have a collection of energy producing uh, units. And we call all of these collectively as distributed energy resources. What we do is when we confine them within a region, imagine putting a fence around all of these assets together and they can be controlled as a single representative unit. Many of these uh, units can be, they can start their life connected to the grid, but then many of them may not start their life connected to the grid, as I mentioned, of the different types of microgrids. But again, they will be operating as a single unit, and that unit is controlled by a very high speed um, 
control system called a microgrid controller. So within the, the communities that we see Envision uh, utilizing microgrid technology, this picture just describes the fact that there are many, many types of assets that play a role in the or organization of how the microgrid works. All of those devices that are electrical in, uh, in a sense will have some level of either control or sensor that is attached to it that a, a single microgrid controller then will um, communicate with and send instructions to. Because a microgrid is different than the larger grid, we don't always have the large rotating mass generators in a large, as a large utility would have. We have very small discrete units and we have to have a different way of managing issues like uh, voltage fluctuation, frequency fluctuation, and demand for power, which we call reactive power. We need to be able to um, commission the devices to work in real time to supply the necessary uh, characteristics that we're looking for. And that's why a microgrid controller plays such a big role. So this is a kind of a depiction of kind of the original thinking of how microgrids would be evolved in large grid systems. You would also have your, you know, your, your typical utility involved where you have a grid operator with their transmission system. And of course they have their distribution system which has many, many substations, which within a substation, you may have an embedded network microgrid or the entire substation and all of that distribution circuit could be its own microgrid. And we've actually seen uh, templates of that. I was involved in putting a, a plan together to convert a very large utility in, into 85 microgrids uh, for all 85 substations. But we see many players coming and playing a role in a microgrid business. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, the, you have the incumbent utility that has an interest, but many times when these microgrids emerge on their own, you have private investors. So we have to respect the needs of both entities. And what we see happening, particularly in, in many of developing countries, is that the best way to provide electrification to more of the population is with public-private partnerships. And one of the pieces of work that I did in India was to help rewrite energy policy that ensured that private investors can build grid um, maintenance and, and, and grid support through their own microgrids with their own investments, which ultimately became connected to the larger grid. So using other people's money, India was able to increase their economic productivity because we designed the uh, microgrids in such a way that they became resources to the larger grid. So the concept is kind of like this. Um, imagine each one of these circles representing a single microgrid. In this case, where we have multiple microgrids that are interconnected to each other, you can see the kind of form a ring pattern. As I mentioned earlier, the many island are ring-based uh, topology. Uh, we see this as a federated microgrid. And it, it may exist uh, on its own because you have private investors in each microgrid, or you may have actually a systematic plan to develop this type of design for a larger grid. We actually have the technology to manage all of this. Any one individual microgrid can stand alone and become disconnected from the rest of the ring and still be self-sufficient. Uh, or the entire system with all the microgrids collectively are under a single control point. And there is the technology already that supports that. So I've actually deployed that in two uh, utilities, uh, one here in Australia and one in North America. So I'm kind of getting back to the grid connected microgrids. Um, we are very much interested in how they can emerge and what are the, some of the reasons why microgrids occur in uh, very high populated areas. We're finding that these microgrids are very successful uh, as long as they're designed appropriately for what we're trying to achieve. So instead of allowing microgrids just to emerge on their own, you actually need a systematic approach to it. We call that a system of system design. But in many cases, the, the microgrids 
not only provide a resource to the distribution operator, but also can provide resources into the wholesale system. And we see this happening in different parts of the world now. So when I talk about privately owned microgrids, uh, we treat the microgrid as uh, an investment by a third party investor who's still selling kilowatt hours directly to the customer. We call that a microgrid as a service. So the investor owns all the assets or he may develop a partnership with the incumbent utility. The utility may operate the lines and poles, but then the third party investor produces the investment in uh, all the generation assets and the control mechanisms for all the rooftop solar that may exist. And then alternately, there's the utility or customer owned utility, uh, customer owned microgrids. Um, and those are emerging just as well and, and quite rapidly. So I'll spend just a few moments talking about some of the challenges in deploying a microgrid. Uh, it's particularly those microgrids that are connected to a larger grid. There are many uh, engineering duties that need to be undertaken. And this is sort of just a real quick list of some of the activities that we have to do, looking at where the investments going in energy generation, in energy storage, do we have demand management? Uh, we have to meter the uh, consumers of energy so that we can monetize the investment. Uh, we may find ways in which to interconnect to the distribution to the wholesale market. And then we also uh, implement quite a bit of, as I said, IT, uh, information technology. So we, in addition to deploying the electrical fabric, we're also deploying the information fabric. And those are done in, in tandem. Now there's an acronym here on that second to the last bullet called DERMS that probably many of you in the utility sector have heard before. Uh, the acronym stands for Distributed Energy Resource Management System. And this is uh, a product and a solution that has emerged in the last five years that has now become very mature. And we see utilities actually owning and operating a DERMS system to control microgrids and uh, discrete assets owned by third parties. So if a third party owns electric storage or a solar panel or an um, electric vehicle, the DERMS actually controls it discreetly on behalf of and, and the improvement in operations of the rest of the grid. A microgrid controller is a scaled down version of that system. Before we undertake the construction of a microgrid, we go through a very exhausting process, which is called a feasibility study. Now, just by the words feasibility study, you probably come to the idea that, oh, we're going to decide whether or not this is investable or not. Well, yes, there's that. But also, the study goes through a complete system design to understand what are the, all of the elements that need to be invested in, what are the existing elements if they exist, uh, how, how do we uh, improve them and, and provide more energy efficiency? And then how do we determine where we're going to fund this project? And lastly, um, does it meet the financial viability requirements for the investor? This is a study that can take a week to two weeks, depending on the size of the project, to many, many months. Um, but anyway, this is a pro process that every microgrid undergoes before we actually make an investment in the assets. Now, I mentioned the fact that there's going to be quite a bit of innovation. Uh, this is a very complex slide, and I'm only going to talk about it at a very high level. Um, there are many participants in different segments of the microgrid market. So just for the microgrid control and energy management at the top left of these series of boxes, there's quite a number of different um, industrial companies who have solutions specifically devoted to that one activity. To the right, we have modeling and feasibility analysis companies, and that's all they do, and they do it very well. Below that, we have data collection, um, control systems, we have building management, uh, heating and ventilation management, 
Um, below that, we have uh, the management of the switch gear, which is very common in, in all utilities, but we still have to ensure that all the circuits have fuses on them, that the transformers are working, that we can move power uh, with a switch. All of those elements uh, still exist, and we have a big, big community of suppliers in that area. And then at the lowest level there, we have all the discrete energy devices. They could be uh, consumers of energy, could be motors, could be electric pumps, they could be electric storage in some cases, uh, or even different types of generators. And the range of generators is quite diverse. On the right-hand side of this series of graphs is a number of organizations that specialize in the engineering construction of microgrids. And then lastly, at the bottom right, uh, just a collection of different investors who are interested in this space. So what I've done is I've captured kind of the whole range of different stakeholders that have an interest in the development of microgrids. So if you thought that was a complex diagram, this uh, I'm not going to go into any detail describing, <laughs> but um, when you control a microgrid, there are many, many assets that have different requirements to be controlled. This is an architectural diagram of a microgrid controller. Uh, I was actually uh, an author of one of these systems and uh, each of those lines has a specific function and there is a, quite a bit of work that goes behind uh, supplying that and it has spe specific duties that it uh, handles. At the top level, you have your analytics, the mid-level supervisory control, then you have your IT network management and then at the lowest level, you have the physical systems, uh, which are typically commodities. Uh, but although it looks like this is complex, um, the typical investor is shielded from this, but the people who want to implement a microgrid have to understand what the requirements are. So I was gonna go through just a few examples of some of the projects that we've undertaken, and then I'll get to the question and answer period. Uh, we've developed projects in, like I said, four different continents. Uh, we have many di different partners. Uh, some of you will recognize some of the names here. Um, two of the names, three of the names on this slide are uh, Australian-based companies. Uh, so we work with a rich range of different suppliers. Uh, as it says on the bottom uh, note there that we've worked in the U.S., in the Caribbean, Australia, India, Kenya, and Uganda. So I'm gonna start here in North America. This is a microgrid project that uh, I built in 2007. Uh, it's a utility owned microgrid. It's uh, out the very outskirts of San Diego and it's very distant uh, from the city and from the operation of the business or from the electrical business. The community frequently had outages due to fire and storms. And there were times when the community of 2,000 people would have no electricity for weeks on end. So we redesigned the uh, distribution utility to actually deploy a microgrid. And this has now been in operations for uh, almost 10 years. Uh, very successful system. Moving across uh, to the Southern Hemisphere, this is where I'm at now. <clears throat> I'm in Western Australia. The uh, red flag there is uh, located in a town called Onslow. I talked about a uh, technology called DERMS, DERMS. Uh, I implemented DERMS here in this town. The town had eight diesel generators supplying power to it. At the, at the conclusion of deploying the DERMS system, uh, we were able to turn off all of the generators at a certain point in time and only run the grid on customer owned rooftop solar and utility owned electric storage. This was a profound change in direction for how a microgrid can be de deployed. We completely removed the carbon emitting component of many of these regional towns by deploying this technology. Uh, I worked in uh, Indonesia for a little bit, uh, helping develop uh, feasibility studies for some industrial seaports. Uh, did uh, quite a bit of work in India. Uh, when I started working in India, we 
So somewhere between 300 and 500 microgrids across the entire nation. At the conclusion of our work, we had over 10,000 microgrids. Um, primarily, they were owned by private investors, but they became resources to the rest of the grid. Did some work in Kenya uh, with lighting systems and a microgrid system. Uh, did some work in uh, Uganda, similar types of projects. These were all uh, started out as village projects that became much bigger because the incumbent utility then wanted to use the public private sector concepts that we had developed. Another project in California, this is a school. Uh, the, the entire school has been taken off the grid and has become self-reliant uh, with some uh, technologies and, and different strategies that were deployed for that. And then a project in the Caribbean uh, working with the local incumbent utility to provide high reliability for some of their uh, resort communities. So that concludes the formal presentation. Uh, this next slide here is one where I was submitted some questions. And what I've done is I've tried to provide some very simple answers. So the first question that was submitted, which standards do you recommend, recommend for ensuring interoperability of microgrids? Uh, remember those very complex slides that I showed you uh, with the graphs. Um, between each layer, there's a set of standards. Those standards are very well known. They're published. Uh, and I can provide more details around those uh, to the people who need to know uh, specifically what the standards are. I, this presentation is not geared for going into the details of all of that, but I'm happy to supply that information at a later time. The last point under that question is inverter standards are the most critical. This is absolutely true, particularly when you have a public-private partnership. If many of the resources are coming from customer-owned assets, those assets have to behave properly on, on the uh, microgrid or on the grid. And the way they behave is by sending signals to the inverter on what that behavior must be. Those standards exist, they're well-established, and the control systems that command inverters was well established as well. Question was sent to me, how do the AMI infrastructure ensure the operation of microgrids? Uh, AMI is the extension of smart grid on the wholesale, on the distribution grid. AMI, advanced metering infrastructure, is absolutely essential for data collection and heuristics, um, neural network kind of machine learning on the behavior of how things operate with tens of thousands, if not millions of nodes. So AMI has become very useful for not only the operation of the big grid, but also for the operation of microgrids. So what we want to do is we have um, metering systems that communicate back to a head end. Uh, I've mentioned the DERM system already. This is the next uh, Next bullet here says, from the utilities perspective, you need to use DERMs, particularly when you have tens of thousands or even millions of connection points. This is something that cannot be done uh, manually at this point anymore. It's absolutely uh, autonomous. <clears throat> the next question sent to me, which protocols do you recommend to monitor and controlling a microgrid? Uh, if you go back to the, Remember the, the slide I talked to you about the architecture of a microgrid controller. Those standards are very well understood. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of what they are, but uh, we know what they needed to be uh, because many of the layers of the microgrid controller are supplied by different parties. You may not have um, the same implementer of the microgrid controller for all the, all the different layers. And so you need to have standards for interoperability. Uh, the next question, which are the challenges to coordinate embedded microgrids in existing networks? Um, because of the experience that we've had and with the adoption of uh, the advanced microgrid where you have a tremendous amount of information technology, we've not found this to be difficult at all. Uh, we actually know how to do it. The science is very robust. The engineering is very sound. And uh, getting back to kind of the Durham system, if the utility deploys something like a Durham's, uh, it's incredibly simple. Uh, the project that we had in Onslow, um, even including the procurement process,
took us about um, 18 months to be fully deployed. And this is a, a town of 2000 residences. Most of them have solar rooftop and electric storage, which we were able to commission. So we understand how to implement that. Uh, the question was about embedded microgrids. It's the exact same problem. Uh, we just have to isolate the portion of the grid that needs to be controlled. What's the, and the last question, what is the recommended control hierarchy for operations from microgrids? With a centralized operator and its observability scheme, again, uh, I like to say that we understand this very well. Uh, I'm going to show you yet another complex slide about the architecture <laughs> of how we make this all happen. Uh, I'm definitely not gonna go into this. Uh, as an industry, we have developed the means in which we can manage all assets across the grid from wholesale generation to transmission to distribution, all the way down to customer owned assets, which we call DER. We know how to do this. Uh, the engineering is there. That concludes uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you for your patience of me getting through some very complex issues, but uh, happy to take questions uh, as the time permits. Muchas gracias, Terry, por tu presentación. Bastante interesante. Well, thank you very much, Terry, for your presentation. It's pretty interesting. It gives us a pretty good introduction for the topic for microgrids. And of course, for our next speaker John David Molina from Colombia Intelligente. He's going to give us a little bit introduction and to present, of course, an opera scholar that it's it's after John David. So at, at the end, at the bottom of your screen, you have a link to Q&A. You're we're going to give in space at the end to ask any questions you may have today. And then, David, I give you the floor. Juan David, ¿nos escuchas? Juan David, can you hear us? Oh, I can hear you, but I think you're waiting for the next speaker. Is that right? Oh, sorry. Uh, is it me? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I thought um, someone else was going to say something first, and we're doing Q&A. Sí, no. eh, vamos a hacerlo, Juan David, pero creo que está teniendo problemas. Yes. Entonces, eh, we're making that right. in that way, but we, if somebody having problems, so to not take anybody's time, we're going to introduce engineer Roy. It's engineer, mechatronic engineer working in Opera Saga, a business development model for East Africa. It's done with a wider experience working with com technology companies and innovation. And he currently in his work, it's giving the new technologies and energy to new communities and for our communities in around the world. So Daniel, you have the floor right now. Thank you for your participation today. Thank you so much. Um, so just a quick one. I think someone submitted a QA. and a uh, Are we going to go through? Do you want to go through the question and answer now or uh, for Terry's presentation or after? Okay. Yeah, at, see, at final. Yes, at okay, the end. Cool. Um, awesome. Can everyone see my screen? Maybe I'll hit present. Uh, perfecto. Uh, buenos días a todos. Uh, muchas gracias por invitarme. I'm really excited to have this conversation with everyone. And mm -hmm. thanks, Terry, for setting the precedence <laughs> for everything that we're actually chatting about. Now, I guess a quick run through of what I'll be speaking about is um, basically the problem that we are trying to solve at Okra Solar, who we are, why we do what we do, uh, what is a mesh grid, and how our technology is being implemented in these rural communities uh, to create opportunities for those who need it the most. Um, so I'm Andrew Nilroy. I manage our business development and operations and activities here in West Africa, I'm based here in Nigeria at the moment. Um, so, I mean, I guess I'll start by a little bit of the pro uh, introduction to the problem that we're trying to solve. So if you look around you, we tend to take the things around us uh, for granted, you know, like running water coming out of a tap, uh, pipe sewage, and 
you know, electricity powering, uh, you know, everything really around us. Now there's like the main problem we're trying to solve is there's about 800 million people in the world without access to energy. And about 20 million of those, uh, I got the number from the World Bank, so it might not be correct, but um, about 20 million of those is just in Latin America who still rely, who don't have access to energy and they still rely on kerosene, diesel generators, charcoal um, for you know, daily activities like cooking, heating, and so on. Now we've seen this across other markets in Southeast Asia, which is where we started our, our company and you know, back in 2016. And that's kind of why we started Okra Solar to address that major issue. Um, so Okra Solar is, uh, we're a technology company developing the hardware and software uh, for energy developers, government bodies, DESCOs to um, bring cl clean energy to all good communities. Um, by clean energy, I, I mean specifically solar. Now through our partnerships with government bodies and energy developers, we've been given some awards by Clean Tech Group as one of the most innovative companies and by Forbes as one of the top 100 companies to watch. Now, as you all know, like developing, actually I'll chat about this first. Basically what our technology is, is twofold. We have our hardware and our software. So on the left, we have our hardware, which is basically the okra pod, which is what we've developed. It's, this is how it looks, it goes in the households. And this hardware works with our software, which is our harvest platform. Um, so why do we build what we did? Now, our target market is um, the off-grid communities. So really, it's the poorest of the poor, usually, in rural parts of the world, which make up a large population in the countries we're in. Um, so I'll chat a little bit about Nigeria, for example, or Africa as a whole, which has a massive energy deficit. Now, compared to Latin America, it's significantly higher. And with the population growth here, obviously, there's a lot more work to be done. But even looking at uh, the population that doesn't have access to energy in Latin America, we need to come up with innovative solutions to make energy more affordable um, to bring to these communities. So as most of you know, as Terry's also kind of mentioned, um, there's a lot of aspects that need to be considered when developing energy, when bringing energy to, these, uh, to any part of the world. So uh, you have to do, I mean, the complex image that uh, Terry shared that's kind of the work that needs to go into bringing energy there. There's lots of moving parts and pieces that need to um, align. Now, developing a mini grid has several setbacks as well, which make them very expensive and difficult to commission. Now we compare ourselves. So uh, our mesh grid technology to AC mini grids, typically because our goal is to reduce a lot of those costs and make it easier to bring energy to the off-grid communities. Now, with the longer timeline for project development and large infrastructure costs to do distribution and ongoing maintenance, the payback period of mini grids is very high. So you couple, couple this with the unique topology of a village and not every household might get connected. Now, in, in this uh, slide, what we're really comparing ourselves to is um, how in setting up AC mini grids, a solar AC mini grids, uh, the bulk of the setup costs are in transmission and distribution. And a lot of it actually and a lot of time is taken to get the land rights and project development. It can take anywhere between six to 12 months from getting funding to actually setting up a community with energy. Whereas we've developed our solution to be a lot quicker and cheaper as well. Now there's limitations on both sides, but the way we see it is you do need multiple types of, multiple types of technologies to solve the world's um, electrification problem. So chatting a bit more about what our Okra mesh grid actually is. So we've developed our okra pod uh, with three things in mind to lower costs of, uh, to lower the capex uh, that's required so that it makes more financial, financial viability for energy developers to bring power to these communities, to provide remote monitoring and maintenance and making it as seamless as possible. And the third side is to, to allow the sharing of power. And that's what I'll chat about here. So in the middle image here, what we've basically done is, um, I guess taking it back to the first, the, the basics, when you are bringing, developing an AC mini grid for a community, you have to get the land rights, identify a location, install your solar panels, batteries, and all the other assets, and then pull cables, uh, thick cables to every last household um, in the community. So what we did is when we first launched, when we were first prototyping our device, and we're trying to address some of the issues, um, this was back in, uh, in Cambodia in around 2016, 2017, we noticed that the time it would take and all these costs really added up to energy developers 
um, not being able to um, convince their investors or uh, that you know it's a, it's a good investment for them to make the revenues that they need. And also, mind you, these off-takers, so the households that'll be getting this energy have very little uh, money to actually pay for the energy. And so we took a lot of those issues into account and we developed this mesh grid. What this basically is, is we call it a decentralized mini grid or an interconnected solar home system, if you wanna call it, but it's with a focus on productive loads. So the way it works is on the household level, you install the okra pod, you have panels and batteries um, on the household level. And then say between six of us, maybe three of us sign up to get energy. So we have assets installed. Now, later on down the road, if our three other neighbors want to get access to energy as well, they can simply install our okra pods and you have cables connecting each of us and we can share power between our assets. Now, what that means is it's a lower investment for an energy developer to bring energy to everyone in a community and it leaves no one out. It doesn't leave anyone out. And um, I guess getting into a little bit of the technical side is our system can function as a solar home system, an individual solar home system, or when you have them in close proximity, you can interconnect them so they can share power. Uh, we use a DC uh, system to share power, but then on the household level, it's an AC system. Uh, the reason we use DC, there's a number of factors, but the key thing is to keep those distribution and transmission costs low. And I can get into that later. If, if anyone has any questions, we can chat more about it. Um, cool. So the, the next step really was to make, make our device able to uh, do all the metering and remote monitoring as well. Now, we built our software. Now, every device is connected by the IoT. And we built our harvest platform to really address a lot of the issues that um, energy developers have uh, in the field. Um, before I get into that, a uh, little bit of a comparison here between what the costs are like for a centralized mini grid compared to our distributed uh, mesh, mesh grid. So you can see like a lot of the main cost comes from the distribution, from the distribution. And uh, when it comes down to the, uh, I guess, uh, in the financial models that most energy developers are working on, it comes down to the cost per connection for a household. Now, the biggest difference between our distributed mesh grid is we're able to more accurately size the loads for a household. Whereas for a mini grid, you have to oversize because you're forecasting the amount of energy that a household will be using. And that's how we've addressed our systems as well. And because we've developed a modular system in these off-grid communities, you can actually start off with really small systems. And as their load increases, because as their load increases, you can add in more solar panels and batteries as well. Now, our target market uh, is, our goal is to reach 100% electrification. And typically in the off-grid communities that we uh, work in, they've never had access to energy. And most of the time um, they've lived uh, without the need for it. So when we bring them energy, we've got to start at the bottom line, at the bottom level. And then we build up their capacity and their needs. And also we need to improve their um, livelihoods through income generation activities. So I'll get into our software now yeah perfect so basically through what we've done is we've enabled our harvest platform to be the one-stop uh, software solution for uh, any energy developer trying to bring power to off-grid communities now the way we do that is uh, i can actually go into the software later if you have uh, if we have some time but the the key things here is you're able to monitor all your households to a really granular level um, on how they're on how they're performing so you can monitor all the equipment, uh, the solar panels, the batteries, um, the inverters, how, how their loads are being distributed across the network. And obviously you can also monitor the mesh grid. So the sharing of power across the households as well. Now, what that means for energy developers is on the financial level, you can actually manage your whole portfolio and see how you have, how you can optimize your growth and you know, maybe um, upgrade the communities to have more energy or push more productive appliances. And we also have a lot of automation built into our operations and maintenance, um, because what we've noticed is, uh, especially in, in rural communities that we work in, an energy developer spends a lot of their capital, um, ongoing capital in sending engineers or their team out to the field. And as you might know, in a lot of these rural areas, it costs a lot of money and poses a lot of risk to the company to send people out periodically. So our system's actually built in a way that enables uh, really local, uh, 
localized maintenance. So for example, uh, imagine you have a community in rural uh, Colombia, maybe in the mountains somewhere, and the developer sets up the assets in the households, you have 100 households. Typically, we would encourage the developer to identify a local maintenance agent. Now, this person is someone who actually lives in the community, might be, might be the village leader or the village chief, or could be anyone really. And then they're trained, they're given a little bit of training to be able to do, uh, for example, the cash collections, um, simple fixes on the network, and um, you know, also maybe incentivized to sell appliances or upgrade the households to the next energy package, depending on how much energy they're using. So what happens is, for example, if uh, as an energy developer sitting in your office in Bogota, you're seeing that um, maybe one of the you're noticing some power theft in one of the households, which is a common problem that occurs where they bypass the system. Now, you might, with our system, you're able to see that and then you, you get a trigger and you can call the local maintenance agent who lives in the community and they can go and actually check what's going on in the system. And rather than having downtime, you're able to action it as fast as possible to make sure the system is running smoothly. Um, so I guess one of the key factors that uh, most of the business models are working towards is increasing that average revenue per user. Now, I mean, that's done through a number of factors and that increasing that ARPU really drives your payback for a whole system. And with our Okra systems, what we're seeing at the moment is optimizing that financial model to get your uh, positive IRRs around seven to nine years. And that's how we're seeing that a lot of the developers are able to scale up their electrification plans. Now, the other side as well is our Harvest platform works with our Harvest app. Now, one of the big things that we've noticed is a lot of developers have to use multiple tools to do their signups, their surveys, and their billing and things like that. So we really try to build it all into one platform. Um, and one of the other things is because our platform has an API built at the back end, we actually can integrate, depending on which market we're in, with mobile money payment. Uh, mobile money and even AC meters or any other equipment you're using to feed data into Harvest as well. And as you can see here, the app can actually be used to track all the payments and uh, do all the collections and also uh, for maintenance. Now, I guess the other side as well is we built a bit of uh, AI into our platform so we can do credit profiling of the households. Uh, now, earlier on, I mentioned that a lot of the communities we work with are you know the poorest of the poor communities really. And bringing energy to these households typically um, doesn't make sense for energy development. Do is through our credit profiling, we encourage energy developers to bring in productive appliances to these households. So think milling machines, grinding machines, equipment that allows them to uh, start businesses like a blender, a television perhaps, uh, or a rice cooker or something. Um, so through this proactive appliance uh, financing, you're able to monitor as well how much revenue you're making from these uh, installments that these households are paying. Yep, and then we have lots of uh, operations and maintenance data. Now, this uh, image here on the bottom right uh, you're seeing is actually real granular data of the performance of all the equipment. And we take a lot of this and we provide very simple instructions on our, on our front end that's really easy to understand for anyone. So I guess uh, looking at how our whole uh, solution works, once you've installed our Okra systems in these communities, you sign them up, and this is kind of the workflow that it goes through um, for the energy developer. Um, I guess one of the other things we do add in is uh, doing simulations for these communities. So typically, uh, how, how the flow would work. So say if... Uh, you know, the Desco in Colombia would like to energize a community and you're trying to identify how many households there are, how much it would cost. Uh, you'd simply share the GPS coordinates with us and we'd run it through our, our algorithms to run this kind of a simulation. I can show you one of these uh, later on if we have time. But what we typically do is we perform, we create, uh, our program runs the simulation and it creates clusters based on some parameters that we've put in. So in this image, you can see there's a number of these clusters and the green dots represent the households and the yellow lines show them being interconnected in a mesh grid. Now, the, the modularity and the scalability of the Okra system really enables uh, it to run as an individual solar home system or as part of a larger mesh grid system. 
Um, so yeah, I guess uh, that's kind of the last slide. Um, the next few slides are really going to the roadmap of what we have moving forward uh, as we're really looking at growing our, uh, our uh, tech technology offering to integrate with AC meters that are in the field. So I guess, Terry, some of the solutions that you're working in um, for urban areas and some rural areas as well, we really see that integrating into our software platform as well and vice versa. And that kind of brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, happy to answer any questions. And um, I guess if you'd like to take a look at our software platform or some of the simulations, just uh, yeah, shoot me a message and we can definitely run through it as well. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Indranil, por tu presentación. Bastante interesante. So thank you very much for your presentation. Pretty interesting technology. I think, as mentioned, can help to rise a very remote communities. And of course, to have this project, to have for all the communities and population in these regions to have access to electricity and logically to carry to a more sustainable development and economically for just communities. And of course, thank you very much for your presentation. And as I mentioned, if you have any question, and please let us in a q and a in the bottom of the screen so i'm just gonna start with the already sent questions so from directly for terry terry this deployment in australia has been the grid connections and contermin established to ensure grid stability do you think the current regulatory framework can affect the effective implementation of microgrids across australia Thank you for the question. Uh, that's a very diplomatically positioned question <laughs> without um, alerting too many people to the negative aspects of policy right now. Um, policy is very critical to encouraging uh, private investment in microgrids. I don't think that um, the way the policies are set up today for Australia, are actually aligned with uh, the adoption of not only microgrids, but also customer owned assets. Uh, we see that, uh, and, and honestly, what's occurring here in Australia, I also experienced when I was in India, uh, rules can be changed uh, if the uh, rule makers understand the uh, benefits of those changes. So, you know, bottom line is the, uh, the current regulatory environment needs to be worked on. Nevertheless, we're finding that microgrids are being built without that change. Do those microgrids support the rest of the grid? No, absolutely not. Because the rules are very protective of the incumbents. Okay. Do you want me to answer you. the second part of the question? Yes. Please, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. The second part, um, the current policies strive to increase the use of electric cars and uh, hydrogen production. We understand that as an industry, there's a desire for net carbon, net zero carbon, um, and, and uh, how to reduce carbon emissions. And we think electric vehicles and hydrogen production are very salient uh, investments. Microgrids can actually enhance that because of the way in which microgrids manage all types of energy resources. We actually have designs specifically for uh, electric vehicles and for hydrogen. Uh, that said, we actually have a hydrogen project in development right now in southern part of, uh, also, uh, southern part of Western Australia, a little town called Albany, where uh, we're taking wave energy, uh, which is producing more power than the um, off takers are consuming and the surplus is going into hydrogen production. So it's actually blue hydrogen coming in off the ocean. Um, electric vehicles, uh, we see that specifically the architecture for that, for, the, for their support is to ensure that you have good generation resources and you have electric storage resources on site where the electric vehicles are being charged. The next stage beyond supporting just the vehicle needing to charge is having the electric vehicle participate in grid-related activities. 
So if there's insufficient supply at the charging station, we would want to tell the car not to charge. Um, those solutions do exist and goes back to my previous uh, discussion on complex systems for utility operations. Okay, great, thank you. Terry. Uh, Indermil, uh, Terry already answered one of the questions that we received earlier, but um, also we would like to hear about which standards would you recommend to ensure interoperability of the microgrids or what is your experience on that uh, sense? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, of course, if like a, if a microgrid is grid connected, it does need to have uh, and meet all the appropriate national and IEC standards for installation and the communication protocols. But uh, I guess with Okra's use case, it's really for those areas which are not viable for grid connection. Typically in the areas we're in, the grid, um, you know, it'll take between 10 to 20 years or really an infinite amount of time to get there because it's not in the country's plan to bring it there. So our philosophy is that a solution that meets is to develop a solution that meets the needs of that community uh, is more important than ensuring interoperability with systems that are not present. Um, we're kind of in a different uh, space, I guess, in, in that in that sense. Okay. And uh, in your experience, which protocols would you recommend for monitoring and control uh, the microgrid? Like the... Yep. Um, well, I mean, our software, which is equivalent to the, you know, the monitoring control uh, software, I mean, so there's many layers of the communication where the decision on the protocol must be made. Uh, with our platform, we've kept it as simple as possible. So we favored a lightweight, uh, low bandwidth protocol like MQTT because it allows us to build a system that can be cheaply and easily deployed in these remote communities. Now, mind you, these are places where internet connectivity is really poor. You have 2G, um, you know, edge connectivity. So we really need to keep our costs down and, um, you know, make sure that even in that low quality, we can use, uh, we can send the data over, uh, over the air. So it doesn't really make sense for us to use our industrial protocols. Again, like our case is not the general case. So that's not to say that all, that this is appropriate for all microgrids. So I think it does need to be done on a project, on a case-by-case -case basis, and an assessment needs to be made. Yeah. OK. And uh, you were mentioning that in, your, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the systems or in the protocol you use, uh, are you, is, is your system compatible with any type of uh, solar and storage system available, or is there any? Yeah, so our, um, so our Okra pod works with uh, can work with any uh, solar panel or batteries, but I guess it comes down to the sizing that you're hoping for that on the household level. Yeah. Oh, so okay. our, our equipment so is all uh, certified and regulated under like the IEC standards uh, and all the certifications we need in the markets we're in. Yeah. Give me one second. And the last question that I received was uh, how would the Amy, uh, AMI infrastructure ensures the operation of the microgrid. Yeah, I guess that's where our harvest platform kind of comes in. So it helps to decentralize the O&M, the operations and maintenance by providing uh, quite simple to-do lists to a local maintenance agent, like I mentioned, uh, and they can follow this on their mobile phone. So our system being remotely monitored and controlled allows the O&M to be carried out by uh, carried out hyper locally by people who live in the community itself. This not only uh, this not only makes it a lot cheaper, but it engenders a sense of ownership. So uh, as we're working with the community, uh, you get that uh, ownership from the community itself. So it reduces a lot of things like power theft and damage to equipment. Um, and it uses those who are the most incentivized to maintain the grid, the residents themselves. And since our system is extra low voltage, one day of training is enough for them to safely operate and maintain the system. But we do need to remember that the technology is only a tool. The incentives must uh, be aligned to ensure uh, effective operation, regardless of what the technology is there. Um, I guess to give an analogy, uh, when COVID hit uh, early last year, uh, we, we have a lot of products in the Philippines and we'd done the logistics and shipped, I think it was around, uh, we were energizing around 60 households on one of the smaller islands. In the Philippines and once 
the equipment was there, it was stored on the island, but then um, COVID hit and Philippines locked down completely. And, you know, it was there for a couple of months. We're thinking, oh, maybe Philippines will open up and we can go do the training and help them do the installations. But then what ended up happening is it, it was like three or four months and Philippines had no signs of opening up. And what the community uh, leaders told us was, hey, we just will install it ourselves. Can you teach us virtually how? And we actually just uh, made some YouTube videos publicly uh, available that they used to watch and they installed and we provided support remotely, but they were able to install it all themselves. And we've kind of designed our system in a way that enables people in the community to do that as well. And we've adhered to the IEEE standards that is, uh, makes it safe for um, non-certified engineers to install our equipment as well. So that's kind of a bit of a, I guess, commentary on how our uh, technology is just a tool and we're incentivizing the community to maintain uh, and operate their own uh, mesh grid network. Okay. Great, thank you very much. I, I think uh, Terry and Indranil were very clear on their presentations. Uh, we will be sending out uh, the recording of this session to everyone that registered. And, uh, and we are hoping to, if you have any additional questions, please let us know. We will be sending it to them and, and send you the answers. And now that we have Juan David uh, on the line, uh, I will just pass the mic to him to close the event. Thank you very much, Alejandra. Just a thank you for General Micromids and presentación que nos han hecho en el día de hoy sobre sus experiencias que tienen con las micro redes. They are having the micro reds a solution to we're having for a lot of interest here in Colombia and we want to thank everybody that were here in the second seminar of this, this series for industries and to be supported by the Australian Embassy and Andesco. We were being supporting to transmit for you this knowledge the transference about the background in Australia, not only your country, but on the whole uh, level, um, level. So we're gonna keep working with the embassy to achieve that integration, the new technologies in our systems, in our sector to make profit of their, those experiences that of course you're very gratefully sharing with us. Ambassador Erica, thank you very much. We're gonna go keep working with you together. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a very nice day. And thank we you hope for the opportunity. to see you all.